Hey everybody, this episode should have been posted well over five months ago. I was just going through the backlogs a few moments ago and realized that while we scheduled this to get released, it's one of two episodes that nobody noticed never went out. Stay tuned for next week when we give you another one that's months later than it should have been. Hey guys, um, are we just creating a cult to a mimic? Is that what we're doing here? Just checking. Welcome to a very special anniversary episode of the It's a Mimic podcast, where we're finally going to sit down and talk about the one monster who we probably should have covered before anything else, the Mimic. I'm Dan, and today I'm all alone in the studio because we recorded this over the holidays and everybody was scattered to the wind. This episode of the It's a Mimic podcast marks the end of year three for us and the beginning of year four. Now, in previous years, we'd like to throw a little odd mailbag episodes together whenever we celebrated the end of one year and the beginning of another, but it's about time to cover the Mimic. We're going to get a chance to hear from everybody at some point about unique Mimics that you should consider adding to your games today, but before we dive into those sticky, sneaky, hidden hungers, let's look at the stock Mimic that's presented in the Monster Manual and the lore surrounding it. Mimics are one of those iconic beasties in all fantasy lore. Any fantasy series worth its salt has some sort of analog to these gluey, gluttonous go-getters, and there's a reason why. They are the ultimate gotcha for all DMs and the ultimate fear to any aspiring rogue or loot-hungry party. You never know what is and isn't a mimic. Yeah, I guess the stereotypical chest mimic is fairly easy to figure out, but that shouldn't stop DMs from using them. It's always best to start with the typical and then branch out from there. And with them being the quintessential shape-shifting predator, the monstrous mimics can go from chest to door to a rug, or a sheave of paper, to literally anything within reach of the hapless soul or souls who happen to stumble foolheartedly into the Mimic's trap. But let's talk individually first. Mimics are monstrosities. They take the form of any inanimate object purely to lure foes close and defenseless. Chests and doors are the favorite forms. These haven't been useful over and over and over again. But they can change their appearance and texture to mimic any wood, stone, or basic mundane material. They're also innately aware of what form will draw a creature close and in contact with its false visage, triggering a trap of sticky pseudopods and sharp pointy teeth. So many teeth. Now, when a mimic changes, it naturally seeps a thick adhesive over its form that aids in the capture of its food, i.e. you. Now, don't get it twisted, a mimic's adhesive can also grab weapons and items just the same. The Mimic does have control over this, either absorbing the adhesive when the Mimic takes on the amorphous Pokemon-esque true form, which, I mean, think of a gray, purple puddle with a dozen teeth, 13 gem-like topaz eyes, and thick ropey pseudopods, or when it needs to sprout a leg or two to skedaddle to its next ambush spot. Now, most Mimics are not only loners, preferring to claim an area as their own hunting ground and not share with other Mimics, but also fairly simple with their intelligence. They are predatory by nature and resemble more a smart animal than a functional wit of one of the intelligent races. There are, however, exceptions to this rule as some mimics can grow smart enough to converse and even make deals, usually in common or under common. The motives of these mimics still, well, mimic the ends of every mimic, its next fresh meal. Just as conversation has an exception in Mimicdom, so does the idea of them being loners. If stumbling across one Mimic in an alley terrifies your slick-fingered rogue, then they definitely won't want to know about the Mimic colonies given to us in Tasha's. There's no limit to the size of a Mimic colony, or what they may appear as. I have seen in my games a Mimic village, a Mimic galleon, and a sheer cliff face Mimic. That's a Mimic colony that covered the entire side of a cliff you can see why the Mimics would think that would be a good idea. Anything from the stones of the buildings or cave walls to the roads and trees leading up to it can actually be Mimics, lying in wait for their next meal. Now, a Mimic colony also boosts the individual Mimic's mental prowess. Any Mimic within 10 miles of a colony can now communicate telepathically with any creature 120 feet away from it, so long as the Mimic and that creature share a language or two. 
And should a colony bear offspring, I guess all that matter from its food has got to become something, the new juvenile mimic can now do this innately, even if further away from the colony than 10 miles. To go along with this boost in intelligence, the ability to survive increases with the mimic colony as well. Should the colony encounter a force that they know they couldn't defeat, the colony instead will try to barter and bargain for survival. They will trade items, knowledge, or even one of their own young if it means the colony can persist another day. Now, if a colony chooses to fight, it gets layer actions. On initiative 20, the colony could choose from a number of abilities, but never the same effect two rounds in a row, like layer actions. Your options are to bind three creatures within 300 feet to move at a speed of zero for a round, or even be restrained if that creature fails the save bad enough. Now, they could also use the help action on a creature of its choice within 300 feet, spit caustic acid at three creatures dealing a potential 3d8 acid damage, or change the shape of a 15-foot cube of any inanimate material to serve its purposes for the next hour. Now, Tasha's doesn't tell us specifically how many mimics can form a colony, so I guess, you know, go nuts, float your boat. But it does say however many mimics you throw in the mix, Add another CR2 creature, or the equivalent of it, to account for the colony itself. Now let's look at the stats we have for an individual mimic in 5e. Your average mimic is a CR2 medium-sized neutral monstrosity. It has a natural armor to it, giving it an AC slightly higher than average at 12. They have an average of 58 hit points, but can have up to 100 hit points total. They're half as fast as your average medium-sized PC, and have a hefty strength and con, with above average wisdom and, surprisingly, dex. Their charisma is about typical for an amorphous, barely sentient embodiment of hunger with an 8, and their int trails last as a 5. However, should you want a slightly more conversational mimic, I'd bump this up to a 7 or a 9. Now, they've got a boost to stealth because they like to hide, they're immune to acid and to the prone condition, and can see 60 feet in all directions regardless of lighting. The typical mimic speaks no language, but again, if you got a smart one, it should speak common and under common. Now, your mimic is a shape shifter, using its action to polymorph into any object or back into its amorphous form. Also, guys, it mentions here that it can use equipment. Guys, your mimics can use equipment. And, should you be lucky enough to kill a mimic, you could tell what is equipment and what is just polymorph pseudopods by its corpse, because it will swap back to its true amorphous form when killed. As an object, when it is in its object form, it is nearly indistinguishable from a mundane version of whatever it is trying to appear as, but it also generates this pre-mentioned adhesive which any huge or smaller creature that comes in contact with the mimic is automatically grappled. Although the creature can attempt a DC 13 athletics or acrobatics ability check on their turn as an action to escape the grapple. Oh, and that check? You get disadvantage on it because mimics, bitches. Finally, if you're grappled by the mimic, it has advantage on all attack rolls versus you while you're grappled. But what are those attacks? Well, it can either thwomp you with a pseudopod for 1d8 plus 3 bludgeoning damage and a plus 5 to hit. And if it hits you with a pseudopod, it instantly grapples you because it's sticky. But that's not the only attack. You see those rows upon rows of sharp pointy teeth? Well, it'll actually use those on you for a bite that does 1d8 plus 3 piercing damage plus 1d8 acid damage. Now don't worry, if it does this to you, you're not subject to the adhesive by the rules. But, I mean... Really, nothing says it has to let go after the chomp. Now, in previous versions, these monstrosities were aberrations, kin to mind flayers and beholders. And I think they fit better here, being otherworldly and bizarre as they are. They were also typically large-sized, other than medium-sized. They were also typically large-sized, against our 5e's medium-sized, and roughly twice as difficult to kill, being a CR4. 3.5 had the namesakes of this podcast as aberrations that were still made by crazy wizards to guard their magical treasures, so aberrations and monstrosities. All editions agreed, though. Your average mimic, although no bigger than a treasure chest, is 4,500 pounds. They're hefty. They're going to be far heavier than you think they are. Mimics like to post up anywhere a hapless intelligent creature will discover it, but also be safe for the slow-moving mimic. They prefer caves, dungeons, dark jungles, and anywhere else dark, moist, and full of hidey holes. 
Once in their preferred space, they will shift into the form of something mundane and expected, but also attractive. A stalagmite might, might be mundane and expected, but may not be the first thing someone wants to touch in a cave. However, a rusted suit of armor or a decayed-looking tablet? It's a mimic. The door that doesn't quite open properly or even to another room? It's a mimic. The ruined tapestry hanging from a pillar in a ruined throne room that's just waiting for someone or something to walk under it? You guessed it. It's a mimic. That random village in the middle of the jungle that has no villagers and is weirdly clean, organized, but also has random loot on open display in slightly bizarrely shaped item shops that your dwarf has an uneasy feeling about? More industrious mimics. The chest alone in a room with blood-stained walls? Well, that, that one's not actually a mimic. It's a trap chest. But the trap door that sits just in front of the chest? That's the mimic. As you can see, these sneaky guys can be anything and anywhere. So if you choose adventuring as a business for your would-be hero, you should be aware that nothing is ever what it seems. And, well, I guess you never really know what you're going to get. It's weird to say that outside of the outro script, but there it is. Okay, so now that Dan has covered what mimics are and how they work, let's jump into some of the other creatures out there that give you that feeling of a mimic, that mimic surprise, without necessarily the mimic flavor. Um, these are all the creatures out there with false appearance. So I came up with a long list of them that have been introduced to 5th edition in the official material so far. However, I'm not going to bother with the couple that exist in the Rick and Morty game. If that's your jam, that's your jam, cool. But I mean, a mimic some mimic. I'm not, I'm not getting into that stupid shit. Okay, so... Let's first of all, before we get into what else there is besides Mimics, let's talk about all the other kinds of Mimics that they've given us in 5th edition. They've given us the basic CR2 one. I'm only going to really talk about CR2 as far as uh, how deadly things are. Um, but you guys are going to be able to immediately figure out what the tactics are based on what the object is that is being mimicked um, with this false appearance trait. So there's the basic Mimic, right, that we've talked about. Then there is um, the chair mimic from Candlekeep Mysteries, the dining table mimic from Dragon Heist, and the rowboat mimic from uh, Mad Mage. Now, you can imagine that each one of these things in and of itself is just absolutely terrifying to interact with. The chair, the dining table, and the rowboat. The chair and the rowboat, I mean, you, you got to plunk your ass down in it first, I think, before it actually reaches out and grabs you. And the dining table, I mean, you're going to hit multiple people at once. I really like these different flavors for the mimics here. Um, and again, it gives you an idea of different unique ways that you can use them. We'll talk about that a little bit later in this episode. But the dining room table um, mimic is a CR3, whereas the other two are still CR2s. There's actually a large mimic listed as well in Mad Mage. And the only real difference is that it's a little bit bigger and has the stats to reflect that. It's still just a CR2. And remember, when you're dealing with CR, this is not an indicator of what your average fight should be up against a level 2 party of, of four characters. It is an indicator of how deadly it's going to be. So if you are a level 2 party, you should not be up against a, a TPK. There should never be a TPK of a level 2 party against a CR2 creature. Um, that does not mean that they will not get a kill. And some of these things are designed to ambush and get a kill. So keep that in mind. Interestingly, we also get a juvenile mimic in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. This is related directly to the mimic colony that they have there, which has got some really cool rules and stuff, and you should definitely check that out if you want to dive deeper into mimics um, and uh, kind of plot hooks for them. My favorite of all of the mimics, though, the one I saved best for last here, is an Icewind Dale, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. There is a spitting mimic, um, which in, I think is hilarious that they missed the opportunity to call it a spitting image. But it's definitely interesting to see them add an extra mechanic to it, and it takes it from a CR2 to a CR5, because this is a mimic now with range. Now let's talk about all of the things with false appearance, and one of the most obvious ones is all of the animated objects that exist out there that wizards... Um, in-game, not Wizards of the Coast, have animated for a variety of different reasons. It's usually for defense or as a great big gotcha for anybody that's trying to rifle through their, their hordes. So we've got 
The CR 1 8 animated knife, this is about as low as it gets. We have uh, an animated halberd, which is a CR quarter, animated armor, which is a CR 1, an animated drow statue, which is a CR 1, and an animated table, which is a CR 2. So you can see the bigger you get with an animated object, the more deadly it becomes. Also, armor or a, a statue here, and this is, interestingly enough, all of these animated uh, creatures are constructs except for the drow statue which is an elemental. Um, and it's just interesting that they treat it more like a gargoyle than they do like a, an object that has been brought to, I mean, animation, I guess not brought to life, but it's not awakened, it's animated. So it's cool to see that there are all of these um, different objects out there and it kind of gives you an idea of what you can use for a basic stat block. The animated knife is gonna be anything that does like your D4 level of damage you can understand that you can use this basic stat block. You can find this one in the Explorer's Guide to Wildmount. In Curse of Strahd, we get the Halberd, which kind of gives you an idea of how to do most weapons if you wanted to animate a sword or a scythe or something. The armor and the drow statue are going to be your template that you can use whenever you want to animate a, a suit of armor, which I have done. Uh, the armor is in the Monster Manual, and the drow statue is in Out of the Abyss. And then, of course, there's the table. Now, we had a dining table mimic, which was a CR3, but the animated table is a CR2, obviously because it doesn't have all that sticky nonsense to it as well. Um, and uh, it is just an animated table that's going to run around and bludgeon people. So you shouldn't really be getting a, a kill in with any of these creatures uh, unless you're a very low level party. But interestingly, they have a different kind of animated um, object out there that is not purely animated. These are things that have been given uh, motion um, and animation, but they're not hit with an animated spell, right? So we've got the flying rocking horse from Wild Beyond the Witchlight, which is CR8. And then everything else, that's a construct. All of these are constructs now. And everything else is a CR1 quarter. From the crystal battle axe from Mad Mage to the flying dagger from Baldur's Gate, the flying shield from Yawning Portal, the flying staff from Dragon Heist, the flying sword from the Monster Manual, and the Flying Trident from Mad Mage. So you're getting more options now for different weapons and things that can fly across the room and, and fight your party. They'll sit there completely dormant, and they will just look like they're part of the weapons rack, or they're on display in a display case, or they're just lying on a table, and then suddenly they spring into action. Normally, you have some sort of trigger when it comes to these animated or flying objects. There are also four other items on the list here that get their own unique uh, stat blocks. There's the Broom of Animated Attack from Curse of Strahd, that's CR 1 quarter. The Guardian Portrait, which is CR 1 from Curse of Strahd. The Rug of Smothering from the Monster Manual, which is a CR 2. And the Gargantuan Rug of Smothering from the Yawning Portal, which is also just a CR 2. These are going to be more unique interaction than, than you would have with something like your uh, animated knife or your flying dagger. However, this is really how I start to think about haunted houses and wizard's towers and whatnot. It, what kind of stuff can I put in there? The objects, the environment becomes dangerous. And that's something that we can think about when we toss a mimic into it as well. I think a mimic would have a lot of fun being in a dungeon full of these kind of um, moving animated objects because it is going to look so mundane by comparison. Now there's one other creature that gets the animated tag and it's the animated tree from Explorer's Guide to Wildmount. It's not awakened, it's just animated. So there's no sentience, there's no consciousness to it. It is just going to swing and move. Um, it's a CR9. Now that's got a real punch to it. And let me tell you something, I don't want to fight a tree. A tree would fuck me up. Even like a, a small tree would fuck me up. You ever you ever punched a tree? I mean, you you're not you're not going to win this. You need you, we we have special tools to be able to to fight and attack and cut down trees and plants and whatnot. And unless you got those tools and the time and the safety to be able to wield them properly, this is not going to go well for you. So the CR9 really does fit. I feel like it could get a kill or two in on just about any tier one or tier two party if uh, if they're not ready for it. You also have then the awakened plants. Now awakened plants are. Um, plants, clearly, uh, that's written in the name there. These are plants that have been given sentience to be able to communicate and move of their own accord and whatnot. Now, there are 
awakened animals of all sorts too, but nothing that really has the same false appearance. And that's the thing here. These things still look like what they are. A shrub, a tree, and a zerkwood plant from uh, Out of the Abyss. The shrub and the tree are relatively low CR, um, CR0 and CR2. So is a zerkwood plant at CR2. So these things are meant to be interacted with more than necessarily fought. These are social encounters, potentially. However, when I'm sitting here looking at the stat blocks for them, I realize that your guys are going to be able to fuck up these creatures pretty easily. You're going to want to have not just one shrub or one tree, but if you're going to fight a druid who needs a bunch of minions, a bunch of awakened trees around or awakened shrubs uh, for an evil elf. Really flavorful, a lot of fun, um, and... They're sentient, but they still seem, I'm going to put this, simple. There's a simple sentience to them. When we're dealing with these false appearances, you have to think, why are they not moving? Why are they staying still? Mimics are hunting. The animated and flying uh, objects and whatnot are not triggered yet. But why is an awakened bush, a shrub, a tree, a zerkwood plant, why are they just sitting there not moving, pretending to be the thing that they look like? And that is because of a number of different reasons. Could be defense, could be because they're just sitting there to monitor and they're spies. It could be the fact that they're waiting for you to get close enough and it's an ambush tactic. A lot of the rest of the creatures on this list are all going to be hunting and uh, malicious and violent. But these three specifically feel like they would be relatively benign at a base level uh, until you piss them off. But speaking of plants, we get a lot of plants actually that are able to just sit back and look like a flower or a vine or a tree, but are actually so much more than that. First of all, we have the blights. Now, not every blight gets the ability to have the false appearance trait. Uh, needle blights, for example, don't. But the twig, the vine, and the tree blights very much do. And twig and vine are from the monster manual. They're CR 1 8 and CR 1 half, uh, respectively. But the tree blight from Curse of Strahd is CR 7. Now, blights are essentially angry, evil plant creatures that have come to life that are just out there to kill whatever they can it's interesting though that they're going to sit back they've got this false appearance which means they're going to sit back and as evil as they are they're going to wait for the opportune moment and that's another thing that we need to think about with all of this false appearance is you're waiting for the right moment to strike and dms i'm going to say this now if you have set up one of these creatures to attack the party but they don't get close enough or they don't manage to trigger whatever it is, um, the hunting instinct or the animated uh, trigger word or whatever it is, if they don't get close enough, these creatures will sit back and wait. Remember, anything that has camouflage ability in the real world has it for defensive purposes for the most part. There are a couple of snakes and whatnot that have uh, camouflage that they use for offensive and hunting purposes, but for the most part, it's defensive purposes. It is a defense mechanism because these things are ambush. And when you think about ambush attack, these are creatures that come in, hit hard, and disappear to hide again. And they're going to use this tactic over and over and over. It can be considered essentially a kind of swooping down from above. You think about how an eagle attacks, it's going to fly down and rake you with its claws, its, its talons, I guess, and then back up into the sky before it swoops down to do it again. I've been dive-bombed by enough crows outside of my uh, an old place that I used to work at that, that was, that's their tactic. They don't sit there and flap and hover and, and stay within arm's reach. They're hit and run. And most of these false appearance creatures are going to be hit and run or you trigger them and they come to life and now here they are. So with the Blights, they really do feel like they are hunters that are opportunistic. One of the defensive things uh, that's in the Monster Manual is the Shrieker. It's a kind of plant, uh, it's a kind of fungus actually, it's a mushroom that is minding its own business until you piss it off. At which point it starts to make really, really, really loud noises. Uh, shrieks even, you might say. Uh, Shrieker is one of my favorite things to use uh, as a way to mix up a little bit of a chase mechanic, especially hiding and whatnot. Shriekers are such a pain in the ass for my party. I recently used Shriekers to trigger a purple worm uh, out in the desert. I put a bunch of these mushrooms out there. There's a field of them and they had to roll these stealth checks to get through. And there were so many NPCs moving through them. I knew a failure was going to be inevitable. And sure enough, when it was, 
a purple worm came up and started to eat NPCs um, because it was waiting for the Shriekers to trigger. Now, they're not the only kind of fungus that we get either, but it's all listed under plant. Uh, we get the violet fungus as well, uh, which is a CR one quarter. The Shrieker, by the way, is a CR zero. Not for offense. This is for defense. I see like I get really passionate about Shriekers, which is very strange. Um, but I, I really like the idea of Druids just creating a... Yeah, have you ever seen Fairy Circles? Um, you can look this up online. The Fairy Circles were just like little plants or, or mushrooms or flowers and whatnot that just appear in a perfect circle out in the wilderness. And everyone's like, oh my god, why? I feel like you could do this on a big level with Shriekers uh, as kind of a defensive perimeter if you're a nature -y kind of uh, NPC or villain. So, uh, as I said, there's also the, the Violet Fungus. You get Thorn Slingers, Man Traps, Yellow Musk Creeper, Assassin Vines, and Kelpies. Each one of these things is a Tier 1 level of threat here. But the ability to ambush, to separate and to ambush, and remember, a lot of these things grab and they hold on. When it comes to plants, specifically, they tend to want to grapple, uh, and they want to hit you hard and fast because they're not really mobile for the most part. Remember, the yellow musk creeper is particularly deadly. That's the one that creates zombies, which we talked about in our zombie episode, which was around episode 108-ish. I don't know. Ish. Yeah, go, go take a look. I don't, I don't remember off the top of my head. But we talked about um, the zombies that these things create. They're fun. They're different. They're interesting. The yellow musk creeper is not your average plant, but it's deadly. These things definitely are hitting uh, outside of their uh, weight range here, their CR class, because they're going to do so much more damage uh, than you're expecting. Beyond that, you have your treants, um, which are a CR9, your treant sapling, which is from Wild Beyond the Witchlight, which is just a CR2. But you also get an undead tree from Baldur's Gate. Now, for those of you, sorry, who don't know what a treant is, um, I'm assuming you've seen Lord of the Rings and you've met Treebeard, and that's what I'm going to say for you. They're just Ents, but Ents, I think, are copyrighted. So Treants, the way that Hobbits are copyrighted, so Halflings. So this is what we get. We get Treants, we get Treants Saplings, which means the Treants have wives, maybe? I'm assuming. Um, but we also get an Undead Tree, which is listed in Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus, which is also a CR9, and that is good and deadly, and I love it. It's also the only undead on this entire list here. We get elementals that have the ability to do false appearance as well. Mud mephits, ice mephits, and magma mephits are, have the ability to blend into their surroundings. There are six different kinds of mephits. Only three of them can do this. The mud mephit is a CR quarter. The other two are CR half. So ice and magma, that, that makes a certain amount of sense. There's the galabdur elemental, which is essentially a rock person, big ass rock person. Um, it's a CR6. It's going to look like a giant pile of rocks or a boulder or um, maybe even a part of a stone wall if you're super creative. And then it's going to step forward and, you know, fuck your shit up. But interestingly enough, also in Elementals are gargoyles. This never sat right with me. I always wanted them to be constructs. But gargoyles um, are CR2 in the Monster Manual and they're CR2 in the Yawning Portal when you run into the four-armed gargoyle from the Tomb of Horrors. But when you get into Tomb of Annihilation, you get the giant four-armed gargoyle, and that is a CR-10. And it's one of the heaviest hitters on this list by a damn sight. Most of this stuff is Tier 1. These uh, little ambushers are, are Tier 1. And that's something else to think about. If you want to throw these in for a Tier 2 or Tier 3 party, you don't necessarily have to beef up the stats. You just have to divide and conquer or add more of them. And it's a lot of fun when you realize that the entire house is coming alive to attack you. They kind of touch on that in the Mimic Colony uh, in Tasha's. However, walking through a jungle and realizing that you are surrounded on all sides by man traps is a little disconcerting. When it comes to gargoyles, though, I mean, it's clear I've never known, I have never known a party to walk in to a room, see a gargoyle perched in the corner, or even like... On the, at the top of a, of an awning or whatnot, or in the corner of a roof, the moment they see a gargoyle, they know, oh, that shit's going to attack me. And that is a damn shame because, I mean, they're right. It absolutely will. But it's a damn shame because it's such a cool, iconic moment. I really, really wish that uh, gargoyles were... Um, there's no real way to, to camouflage them any better than they already are, but I, I wish that 
that people would use more gargoyles because they're just they're just so fucking awesome. I also want to give them like magic powers and shit, but that's again I'm I'm a big fan of gargoyles for some strange reason. Um, but I'm a big fan of constructs that come to life. That's just a classic aspect of fantasy and magic, as far as I'm concerned. We do get a number of them here, not as many as we got for animated creatures or plants, but there are some. There's a bunch of CR1 creatures that are exactly what they look like, but they're made of a organic kind of metal or wood or whatnot, and they're brought to life. So there's the bronze sable from the mystic odyssey of Theros, there's a Clockwork Dragon from Acquisitions Incorporated, the Scarecrow from the Monster Manual, the Stone Cursed from Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, there's a Terracotta Warriors from the Tomb of Annihilation, and the Tin Soldiers from Wild Beyond the Witchlight. All of these, like I said, CR1, and you know what you're getting into. Scarecrow, Clockwork Dragon, Terracotta Warrior, Tin Soldier, you know what these things are. You also get in Wild Beyond the Witchlight, a couple of other things as well. I, I don't know why Fae are so, like, hellbent on constructs, apparently, but they are, and I'm weirdly cool with it. I, I wouldn't have naturally put those together, but there's a kind of a nice synergy there, especially when you get things like a glasswork golem, which is, I believe, it's been a while since I've, I've flipped through the book, I believe that's a stained glass window that comes to life and attacks you. And there's also a living doll, um, so enjoy your nightmares there, ladies and gentlemen. We also get the Stone Defender from Tome of Foes as well, as well as the Statue of Talos. Now, this is a little bit of a unique one because it comes from one of those officially published but not officially printed Wizards of the Coast products. It comes from Storm Lord's Wrath, which is an online-only digital adventure that was released as additional content for the Essentials Kit. Once you have done the uh, Dragon of Ice Spire Peak, which is the adventure that is in the Essentials Kit, once you finish that, there's actually a trilogy of adventures that you can get online to follow up and continue on that storyline. We don't really talk about them on the podcast much because they're not really not mainstream enough to get into on a deep dive. But yeah, maybe we'll do it in the Legend Lore sometime. I, is that something you guys are interested in? Let, let me know. Write to us. You know how to get a hold of us. We'll we tell you every episode. So um, anyway, after Constructs, that pretty much brings us down to the last uh, main category before we get into just kind of the weird, um, odd monstrosity ones. And that's the oozes. We do get some oozes. There are gray oozes that have false appearance where they just essentially cling to a gray dungeon wall and blend in until suddenly the wall attacks you. Um, and it's just an ooze. Now, they're CR half. But did you know that you get a sentient one in Yawning Portal? It's also CR half, which, I mean, shows you what the uh, creators think of sentience there. Doesn't make you more deadly, apparently. There's also a reduced threat gray ooze. Now, this is an interesting thing that the Tales of the Yawning Portal did, was because they had very specific adventure paths, these little modules inside, these dungeons that you're crawling through, they wanted to add all this cool stuff to it, but they didn't want it to be too deadly. So they came up with these reduced threat versions of some of the creatures there. Uh, now, it's still a CR half, because you can't get much lower than that, but it doesn't pack nearly the wallop that the regular Grey Ooze does. Not like the huge Grey Ooze that's in uh, Waterdeep Dungeon of the Mad Mage, because that is a CR 8, and that I can absolutely see fucking up a party. That feels like it is going to be as deadly, if not deadlier, an encounter than a gelatinous cube or a black pudding. We also get the Slithering Tracker, which is kind of your... Bounty Hunter Ooze, I mean, for lack of a better term there, um, which, again, if you're dealing with false appearance, if you've got a construct or an elemental, a plant, or an object that's out there to, like, what great assassins these would, these would be, hey? Imagine that. There you go. There, there's, a, there's a gift for those of you out there that are trying to do the next murder mystery in your campaign. That just sounds like a lot of fun where, you know what? It, it was the broom that was killing you the whole time. Uh, all of these people were, were completely killed by the house plant or were wiped off the face of the planet by the, uh, what else do we have here? The flying shield that is hanging on the wall. Everyone is like, oh my God, someone keeps picking up the shield and beating them to death with it. Nope. The thing's just, just literally triggered and off it goes. Anyway, so um, Slithering Tracker is another interesting ooze that you can use. It's in Volos. Uh, you can get in there and get the fun details. We will be covering these in a deep dive moving forward, so I'm just kind of glancing off them now. You also get the Trapper. Now, the Trapper is from Volos. It's a CR3. I like it, but it's kind of shitty too, um, as far as uh, 
surprise fuck you to the party. The trapper is, it has the ability to flatten up against the wall. It essentially looks like a manta ray that flattens up against any surface and has on the exterior surface of it has the ability to camouflage almost perfectly. And not just in color, but also in texture as well. And then it will attack and eat the shit out of people. So I I like the trapper well enough. Um, also, you can get it anywhere from a basement and a cellar to a to an attic, like into a dungeon. Or there's no reason you couldn't have one of these things wrapped around an actual statue, right? And everybody's trying to target the head of the statue, but it's wrapped around the base. The pedestal is one of these trappers that are that's eating people, right? Like this gives you some real cool fucky opportunities. Maybe a little too fucky sometimes. Remember, your players are supposed to win, and trappers. I feel. Five or six of these things in a room can be pretty deadly. Um, speaking, though, of underground dungeon-type areas, we have Dark Mantles and Piercers. Now, these two things felt a little redundant at first. These are both creatures that mimic stalactites and stalagmites in caves and caverns. And their tactic is they drop down upon unsuspecting foes, and they crush them, and then eat them. They hit you, and then they eat you. And that's, that's the thing with them. Dark Mantle is a CR half. The Piercer is a CR half, and they're both in the Monster Manual. In Tales of the Yawning Portal, we get a reduced threat, Dark Mantle, which is, again, CR half. So, what are we doing with this? Oh, oh, in Icewind Dale, we get the Ice Piercer. So, this is going to be like an icicle, except it's still just a CR half. So, you see, we're getting the same kind of thing over and over and over again with these. I don't know why we get two of them. And then, when you dig into the lore, you realize that the Dark Mantles are their own creepy squid-like things that hang upside down and drop on you. And that's creepy enough. They also have kind of like a dark aura around them. So, sure, they get a little bit more than the Piercer does. But the Piercer is actually a larva of a Roper. And a Roper is one of these creatures that looks like a stalactite or stalagmite. And it, stalactite or stalagmite, there we go. And uh, it sits in a cave. And when you walk by, a giant eye opens up on it. And these tendrils come whipping out, grabbing you and pulling you towards this giant toothy maw. And it's going to try to eat you. I love ropers. They're classic D&D. If you've never fought one before, you're missing out. I'd love to do a deep dive on ropers. I've used them to great success to terrorize uh, my party. They're CR5. They hit outside their weight range. They really do. This is going to completely fuck up. You will get a kill with a roper if you are not careful. Especially if you go over to the Princes of the Apocalypse where you get a Molten Magma roper or over into the Dungeon of the Mad Mage where you get the Shape-Changed roper and I'm like, what the fuck is that when I was doing my reading? Apparently the Mad Mage, Halister himself, fused a Mimic and a roper to make a roper that can disguise as anything, which is nasty. But my favorite detail about it is its name is Miguel and it responds to it and you can interact with Miguel the Mimic Roper, which is a lot of fun. Uh, you also got Cloakers, which are CR8 in the Monster Manual. And these things are, I mean, you're going to find these in taverns and whatnot. Uh, or just kind of hanging on a uh, coat hook, maybe in an abandoned house. They look like a cloak. And when you put them on, they strangle you, they attack you, they grapple. It's, it's nasty and gnarly and they tend to strangle people out. Uh, I like Cloakers. It always feels like these things are more trap than they are creatures, though. Um, because one person triggers it, it attacks one person, everybody gangs up on it and fights it, and everyone goes, oh, wow, wow, it's a good thing we killed that thing, and then they move on, they never think about it again. There's not a whole lot of motivation behind a, a cloaker. The last thing, the final creature that I'm going to talk about that has the ability to use false appearance is the Alkalith Fiend. I've used this in my own games, and it is super deadly. Now, the, the Alkalith is a demon. That's the first thing. It's a CR-11, and the, the scariest thing on our list today. Uh, it looks, from my recollection here, uh, it looks a little bit like uh, moss with a bunch of little eyes that are, like, looking around. Little demonic eyes that open and close. It can creep around. Uh, it looks like a plant, and it tends to hide around doorways and uh, archways and maybe even, like, in the mouth of, a, of an unused fireplace or a hearth. And while it can attack, its main purpose 
is to actually open up portals to the abyss and let other demons through. It's hardy enough to warrant the CR-11, and I remember my Tier 3 party having a real hell of a time fighting this thing as there are other demons coming through. And they just couldn't kill it in the first one or two rounds like they really wanted to. So it's going to sit there and dole out a little bit of punishment, but it's mostly going to be summoning in bigger, badder, scarier things. So the Alkalith, as a creature with false appearance, is not going to, like, of all of them, this is going to be the strategic one that doesn't want to get found out. Ever. Even... When it wants to get a kill, it's not going to do it itself. It's going to get somebody else to do it, right? I mean, I guess the Shrieker kind of does that as well. But anyway, those are all of the creatures in 5th edition so far that I could find uh, that have false appearance. You should start thinking now about ambushes and why we ambush and how we ambush and in what numbers that we do it in, what triggers us. Will we let the party go past before we decide to jump on the last guy? Do we focus on the weak one? Are we opportunistic? When I look at piercers and dark mantles, are they going to be opportunistic and hit the first thing that comes by? Because there's not a whole lot out here um, walking through these caves. Or are they going to be able to identify what the threat is? Some of these creatures will, but there's not a whole lot of high intelligence on this list anywhere. So when you, which is odd when you think about these ambushers, it, can you imagine, like, you want to do a homebrew creature that's particularly scary? You put high intelligence with the ability to have false appearance. Now you're scary. And of course, I didn't end up talking about doppelgangers or uh, changelings, but that's their own crazy separate story. And we'll dig into those in a future episode. Before we go any further, I just want to remind everybody that you can reach out and hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, or on Reddit at r slash it's a mimic. We also do go through all of the YouTube comments out there, although I ignore about roughly half of you insensitive assholes. And um, there's also uh, um, our email address, which is info at it's a mimic dot com. I'm curious to know what you guys would do with this false appearance tactic, how you've used this in the past to either great success or tragedy. And, uh, and of course, hit us up for mailbag questions. We have a post that is stickied up at the top of our subreddit. You can go in there, or you can just flip us a message somewhere and say, this is for the mailbag. We're always happy to hear from you guys. So make sure you go out there and, uh, and interact with us. We want to know more. And if you are so inclined, of course, you can head over to our website at www.itsmimic.com and check out our store, which should be getting an update relatively soon, I'm hoping. Um, or just hit the donate button if you want to help us out there too. Let's get back to it. So now that we've covered all the different options for mimics and creatures with false appearance in the official 5e material, let's run around and see what everyone else would make for a special kind of mimic that your players may not be expecting. Because, I mean, we all want mimics at higher levels. Hey there, this is your ever so friendly host Megan and I am here to actually chat some fun ideas about some zero CR mimics. Honestly, anything zero CR should really be used for either hilarity and entertainment or just to be downright annoying. For real, like such things, it's just such a great way to kind of punish your players if you feel like it, or just to add a little bit of sustenance. So for instance, they find a bag of gold and lo and behold, each coin is a random mimic that just runs away when you try to pay or just screeches every time that you try to shuffle around your backpack. Or like think of like a swarm of rocks that is constantly following your players. So every time they stop to make camp, there's a strange arrangement of rocks that's just constant and always following them. But one that I thought that would just be a hell of a lot of fun would just be imagine your players are traveling through a desert and then they come across a water, like a random water skin. And then they pick it up and it just happens to be a mimic. But they can't tell yet. All they know is that they've luckily found themselves a water skin where randomly the water will just randomly disappear. And then there's strange whistling sounds or something that comes from out of nowhere, or your players start to think that they're hearing voices in their head. But really, it's just an annoying water skin telling your player to just don't go that way. And, you know, and sometimes bites you because you're food. And this is just how they survive. Travelers pick it up along the way, consume any water it's given, eats food that's in your backpack, until it's found out, and then it's discarded. Sad and lonely life. But just a little fun spark to add to whatever, you know happens in your game gives you a little something to spice up so that travel time that for some players can be a little bit boring gives them something to do something to focus on and something to try and a little puzzle to figure out that's just a little bit of fun a little hilarity so hope this helps and gives you some ideas on what to do with some very cute little zero cr mimics hey everybody it's jeff i've decided to come up with a mimic that's a little more mobile than the standard mimic this is going to be a wagon mimic at cr4 
This guy has an armor class of 14 and 128 hit points, coming from 13d10 plus 56, and a speed of 50 feet. This guy's got high strength and constitution, but I've otherwise left the stats from the regular Mimic the same as they were. It relies on the same stealth modifier that the regular Mimic has, and the same immunities. Pretty much the same senses. Um, the big thing here is that this is just going to be a large wagon on the side of the road that when someone climbs in to investigate what's going on with this abandoned wagon, it grapples the target and then runs away. It only really tries to fight the grappled target in the bed of the wagon and just rushes off at 50 feet per turn, trying to get away with its easy meal if it possibly can. So, not so much of a huge threat for the party, but could be a threat for one unwary player character and definitely adds a bit of a chase to a standard random encounter if that's what you wanted to do. Um, not relying on any, on any new mechanics or new tricks other than just it's bigger, stronger, and faster and doesn't plan on sticking around to fight it out to the end. Just grabs its meal and fucks off into the night. Hello everyone, my name is Terry and I shall be presenting to you a CR6 Mimic. And how about a CR6 Mimic in the form of a chandelier? Not too threatening, I hear you thinking. Well, how about a CR6 Mimic in the form of a chandelier that comes with 12d10 plus 40 hit points and a freefall ability that allows it to grapple and pin multiple targets? That's right, let's use a 5 foot radius for that. And don't forget, chandeliers are often littered with candles. Candles that are needed to light the room or dungeon that they are in. Those candles will set things alight after the chandelier falls and begins rolling around the room chasing your players. If the players are adept enough that they might extinguish these candles, that means that the players are now fighting the chandelier CR6 mimic in the dark and your human fighter can no longer see. Devious. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Pepperina, and I've been thinking about a CR8 Mimic that is particularly tricky. So imagine your party comes into a town and something seems just not right. They find out this town has been collectively sacrificing people to an altar of their deity. They perform a sacrifice at the altar and leave, and by morning the body is completely gone with zero trace. They believe so deeply in this ritual they can't be reasoned with. But what if that altar was a mimic? It's gotten the townspeople to do all of the work for it, essentially creating its own cult. All it has to do is sit back and wait. I'd definitely bump up its AC. After being in stone form for so long, it would stand to reason its skin is a bit tougher than average. And crank up those hit points because this thing is growing at a rapid pace from its steady diet. Now, if your party discovers it, maybe with a sting operation, then great, they save the day. But if they choose to ignore it, like players often do, then it could become a big problem down the road, gaining power from all the worshipping from the townspeople, maybe even gaining godlike powers. Hey guys, Tyler here, and I have for you an interesting idea for a CR12 mimic. Imagine this. The party walks into a room. Now, it's nothing special. There's trinkets on the ground, maybe furniture thrown, or maybe upright, up to you. Doesn't seem anything too special, but party notices on the far end is a large wall with, you know, strange markings on it. And just, it, it looks like there's a different kind of language or something on there. The party has to investigate more. They can't know from standing at the door. Now, obviously... Most parties will just go in and see, what's of value on the ground? Is there little trinkets I can take? Ooh, is this magical? But you're going to have that one person that says, I'm going to look at the wall, at the intricate markings. And so everyone rolls an investigation check. And the one person looking at the wall, as they're looking, as they're inspecting, they hear a click as they hit a pressure plate. And the stone pillar drops right in front of the entrance that they all came in. And at that point... The markings on the wall, all the markings, start to move. Teeth start to protrude from the very wall and then start to circulate around and around as giant red eyes appear at the top of this wall and you hear the whole thing gurgle. Welcome 
the wall mimic. Now, this is a C or 12, guys. So, it's a pretty monstrous pile of hit points and strength. And here's the thing. It is moving towards the rest of the party. This room suddenly starts to become smaller. Now, here's the thing about this. This mimic is a pile of hit points and strength, but it moves real slow. So, the party suddenly can try and chip away at the hit points of this thing or look around. Because here's the thing. This has suddenly gone from just a pure combat to a dynamic encounter, which includes combat and exploration. Because the party suddenly doesn't have to just hack at the wall, but it can look, how do we get out of this room? This thing's coming closer, and this is the CR12 environment, guys. This is timed. They have a certain amount of time, or else this thing will squish them, because it's that strong. It is monstrously strong, and if you get too close to those teeth, it is going to, well, chip away at your hit points. So, it has the potential of being a TPK, if the party doesn't think. Now, this is a CR12, so it's not impossible. There are ways around this. You can try and make their own exit. They can try and disable the trap. They can chip away at the massive hit points of this thing. There are ways. But what makes this encounter so challenging is they have to think on their feet. My idea for a unique, one-of-a-kind mimic would actually be a money pouch. But... Unlike most mimics that will attack anything and eat anything, this one actually stores coins and the owner is able to open it and retrieve them as if it's any other money pouch. But when someone tries to pickpocket them, their hand gets eaten off. Similar to the concept of the monster book and monsters that you will find in the Harry Potter series that you would have to massage the spine before you could open the book to read it. Otherwise it would attack you. Even as a DM, Having an item like this placed on guards or on high-level NPCs that your rogue may want to try to pit pocket from that you really don't want them losing their valuables. Great way to get that rogue to learn a lesson, to at least a look before he reaches. It also raises the question if this becomes a common item in your game world, where it comes from and how is it made. Is there just some mimic farm somewhere in some cave where some dude is just teaching them... This is the way you let people open you. And then the question arises, where is the money being stored? Is it in its stomach or is it in a similar to a portable hole or an extra dimensional space? If it's an extra dimensional space, what else can be stored in there, such as gems, jewelry, and the like? And what's its size and capacity? These are all questions you can flush out to make it quite unique to your world. It could also be used as a such secure transport method when adventurers are hired and they are not trusted not to steal the item being transferred. They give them the mimic pouch that holds the item and attacks anyone who tries to steal it and when delivered to the location they have a way to open and retrieve their item. Hey guys. Wow. Three years already. Time sure does fly. I'm going to present you guys today with A Mimic with a CR of 14 is what I was kind of given to work in that range of. And the type of Mimic I want to work with is a Wardrobe Mimic will be kind of its favorite form, obviously stealing the concept from C.S. Lewis and Lion Witch in the Wardrobe. Uh, To further on that, the kind of special abilities I want to give to this Mimic are the ability to have a teleportation circle. I'm picturing a Mimic that's, you know, been hiding in a mansion or a wizard tower or somewhere like that for years and over the years has managed to make a permanent teleportation circle to a plane of its choice. I'm picturing perhaps a plane where there is a colony of Minimics back home. Maybe this is a forward scout or a spy, something like that. So with this teleportation circle, it would be able to move freely back and forth from the place of its choosing, as well as having the ability to bring other creatures with it. In order to assist with the moving of another creature, I would give it the paralyzing beam that we find on the retriever from Mordekainen's Tome of Foams. Basically, a beam that focuses on a player up to 60 feet away and a DC of 18 on a constitution saving throw. Otherwise, you're paralyzed for a minute. Because once you're paralyzed, this mimic is basically going to be able to grapple you, pick you up, and carry you through the teleportation circle, forcing the rest of the party to follow through. As for stat line, this thing's going to have a somewhere in the range of 200 hit points. So to make it easy, 20d10 plus 100. 
Uh, it's going to be having a fairly high strength and constitution, a decent dexterity, I think, and an average wisdom dumping both intelligence and charisma, I think, is how I would do that. Uh, picturing wisdom being the uh, casting statistic. But yeah, I really can easily see this mimic being located Again, in a mansion or a wizard tower, somewhere where it's inconspicuous. But it's going to be sitting there with the doors open as the party comes in. And through the doors, the players are going to be able to see this portal that's going to entice them. Should someone walk through willingly, they don't know what necessarily where they'll end up. Uh, should they be hesitant, then the mimic will take its chance. Should it choose to attack the party, paralyze someone, and drag them through the portal, following, forcing the rest of the party to follow. Uh, I also should mention the skills. Uh, perception should be high. Stealth should be high as well. But yeah, that's my concept for a mimic. So the idea I had for this uh, was a fire mimic, okay? And I came up with a, with a CR-17, what I called a fire mimic. I originally named it Dave just to piss off Dan, but... Uh, anyways, uh, I gave this thing a fly speed, but only if it's mimicking something that can fly. Uh, and the idea is that this thing is going to, like, fly up to the ceiling, latch on, hide, and then drop down and attach to you. And when it does attach, uh, it does fire damage. So uh, I also gave it some, uh, some resistances, uh, like, obviously fire. I gave it immunity to acid and poison, because, you know, why not? Big CR. Uh, and then I made it immune to being blinded, deafened, diseased, charmed, stunned, uh, immune to sleep, unconsciousness, and prone. Gave it some dark vision and some tremor sense, and its passive perception is like a 27. So, uh, this thing is just like, it's going to know you're there, it's going to hide above you, and it's going to fall down. I gave it an ability which I called burn. If the mimic is engaged in a grapple, so if it's actually, you know, got its, its pseudopods on someone, uh, that opponent takes 6d6 fire damage at the beginning of their turn. So there's there's this ongoing grappled effect too. It's going to hurt you while it's attached to you without having to do anything else. Now, uh, aside from the regular mimic options, you know, the false appearance, adhesive, shape change, all that stuff, I also gave it the mimicry ability because, I mean, it should just have that, right? So it can imitate animal sounds and human voices, uh, and it's going to take you a high wisdom check to make sure uh, or, or to, to know whether or not that it's real you know so i gave it an 18 dc for that one uh, i also gave it an ability called death from above which i really really like i uh, gave it a plus 12 to hit and the idea well it does 4 d10 plus 10 bludgeoning damage so when this thing falls from the sky it hits you and then it does fire damage as well which is again 66 but this the burn for death from above happens when you walk underneath it uh, so the idea is that these guys are small creatures. I actually have it as a small monstrosity, so they're a little bit harder to see. They hide really well. Uh, they perceive really well. Like I said, tremor sense. They can't be blinded. They've got dark vision. Uh, and just for some fun, I gave them some legendary actions, which is just a pseudopod attack, um, which at this level, I gave it 7d10 plus 10, because like, that pseudopod's going to hit, and it's going to hit probably... Uh, once with that and a bite like this mimic is meant to ambush again so i just really liked the idea of having uh, these small creatures that were like you know cave dwelling almost but not necessarily maybe they're in houses hello everyone so today i was lucky enough to be given the task of coming up with a cr20 mimic now, I had a couple ideas for this. Unfortunately, one of them I didn't think of until a couple minutes before I started recording this, so I didn't have time to make a stat block. But the lore is essentially the same. So without further ado, allow me to introduce you to this one, uh, as it refers to itself as. It also speaks in the third person. Now, this one has survived for many centuries, where its kin have perished by being smart, watching, waiting, learning. Where others like this one have tried to attract any and all to it, this one waited, biding its time, attracting only those who would not be missed, never taking more than what was needed. Over time, this one has been many places, been many things, seen many people, but one thing was always the same. Adventurers. Lousy, stinking adventurers. Coming into this one's homes, Killing this one's kind just for trying to survive. 
killing others that shared this one's homes to fill their greedy pockets, murdering all they could, taking more than they needed. This one was disgusted. This one's hatred was stoked with each new party, its rage burning so hot it could boil oceans. But this one noticed something, too. With each new party, there were always a few who survived, looking lost, scared. So this one suggested partnerships. Revenge is a most excellent motivator. This one and its party would go out looking for those whose homes had been destroyed, families killed by filthy adventurers, and recruiting them for its cause. All were welcome here. Now this one's new home, this one and its new family took up residence in an old kingdom buried deep in a mountain range. A labyrinthian network of tunnels crossing many spans where it lures adventuring parties with whispers of untold riches that lie at its heart. So, the idea with this mimic is not so much that it has one specific shape, but that it is the dungeon itself. You lure parties there with whispers of a different big baddie, say a dragon or some mysterious cult that's kidnapping children, uh, because this mimic is sending out its ragtag collection of minions into the world to spread rumors to try to lure adventuring parties into its home. Say maybe your party finds a goblin or a kobold looking lost and scared by the side of the road. You know, small creatures always kind of elicit sympathy in a party, and that is exactly what I mean to prey on and exploit. So I'm not going to go too much into detail with the actual stat block, because I feel like I'd be here for a while. Um, you know, I'm going to have the average amount of hit points for its CR. The big difference is I'm going to have give it a 25-foot walking speed and a 60-foot burrow speed, because I feel like burrow is an underutilized form of transportation in this game. It's a lot of fun, and I want to use this creature as a uh, hit and run. And so just bam, 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 and then getting out of there. I also gave it a tremor sense because I felt like it would have fit in well with the flavor of having um, a burrow speed. I also gave it telepathy for 300 feet because I felt rather than having a spoken language, telepathy would make more sense when it's trying to communicate with such a broad range of creatures. For traits, I gave it the usual flavor, the adhesive shape changer, false appearance, grappler. Uh, for its actions, I gave it a multi-attack, making three pseudopod attacks and one bite attack. This thing is going to have up to six arms, and it can grapple up to six creatures at once. Its bite attack will be able to swallow any creatures, large or smaller, uh, and it also has something that I dubbed the Welcoming Embrace Aura. So any creature that's hostile to this one that starts its turn within 120 feet must make a DC 21 Wisdom saving throw, unless this one is incapacitated. On a failed save, this creature must use its movement to move closer to this one, and if a creature's saving throw is successful, it's immune to this aura for the next 24 hours. I gave it legendary resistances, three per day, as well as three legendary actions. I gave it pseudopod, uh, using one point, withdraw, where this one disengages itself from combat, avoiding any opportunity attacks by burrowing into the ground and moving up to double its movement speed. Uh, and then I also gave it tripping swipe, uh, where it can swing its pseudopods around itself in a 30 foot radius, dealing 3d8 a plus 8 bludgeoning damage, knocking prone any creature that fails a DC 20 dexterity saving throw. Now, how I'd use it in scenarios is that this one isn't meant to be just an object, like a chandelier or a chest, like a regular mimic. It is entire tableaus. This thing has a sense of the melodrama to it. So <laughs> I want it to be something like the party enters a large room with a raised dais and an ornately worked throne. And I guarantee you, if you throw a throne in a room and go into detail about how beautiful it is, someone will sit in it. Players might be wary of the chair itself, but they'll never suspect that the whole platform is actually the mimic. And then next, they come across a dungeon, finding several whatever your party's weak spots are locked up, screaming for help. They rush in to help. Boom! The dungeon gates were the mimic. 
And those trapped creatures, well, they start attacking the party too. Next, your party comes across a glittering crystal bridge that spans a huge bottomless cavern. And on the other side stands another ornately worked gilded throne, even more beautiful than the last. Now your party is wary this time. Little do they know, it's actually the bridge that's the mimic this time. I might even throw a massive boulder rolling down the path behind them so that they can't spend too much time thinking about it. Whatever, you get the idea. What I like about this mimic is that you can throw just about any and all baddies you want into this dungeon. You want some gnolls to fight alongside some drow? Sure, why not? This one has curated a veritable menagerie of lackeys. You can throw in some neutral NPCs just to fuck with them. Maybe a couple surviving members of other adventuring parties that were lured down there and have them just clamoring for insight checks. So that's all for the special anniversary episode of the It's a Mimic podcast. Thank you for supporting us through another bizarre year. We hope that next year is even more bizarre, but in better, healthier ways. Thanks for listening to another episode of the It's a Mimic podcast. If you'd like to support us, we have a donate button on our website, www.itsamimic.com, as well as a store for some deceptively hungry merch. We also rely on word of mouth to get news of the podcast out there to the community. So please pass the word to everyone you know that we're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, as well as most podcast apps. Thanks again for listening to It's a Mimic, where you never know what you're going to get. Motherfucker, I gotta start this whole thing again.